Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to discuss an ancient source from Diodorus Sicilus's Library of History. It is an account of Egypt in those very ancient times. So, with that, let's begin. If you like this kind of content, just like and subscribe, and it'll be sure to come up on your YouTube recommendations. Diodorus Sicilus, Library of History, An Account of Egypt In this volume, we shall discuss the topics which come next in order after the foregoing. We shall begin with the kings of Egypt, and set forth their individual deeds, down to King Amasis. After we have first described in summary fashion the most ancient manner of life in Egypt. As for their means of living in primitive times, the Egyptians, they say, in the earliest period got their food from herbs and the stalks of roots and plants which they grew in the marshes, making trial of each one of them by tasting it. And the first one eaten by them most favoured, that which is called agrostis, because it excelled in others in sweetness and supplied sufficient nutriment for the human body. For they observed that this plant was attractive to cattle, and quickly increased their bulk. Because of this fact, the natives, in remembrance of this usefulness of the plant, to this day, when approaching the gods, hold some of it in their hands, and they pray to them. For they believe that man is a creature of swamp and marsh, basing this conclusion on the smoothness of his skin and his physical constitution, as well as the fact that he wears a wet rather than a dry diet. A second way in which the Egyptians subsisted was, they say, by the eating of fish, of which the river provided a great abundance, especially at the time when it receded after its flood and dried up, they also ate the flesh of some pasturing animals, using for clothing the skins of the beasts that were eaten, and their dwellings they built out of reeds. And the traces of these customs still remain among the herdsmen of Egypt, all of whom, they say, have no other dwelling up to this time than that of reeds, considering that with this they are well enough provided for. After subsisting in this manner over a long period of time, they finally turned to the edible fruits of the earth, among which may be included the bread made from the lotus. The discovery of these is attributed to some by Isis, but to others by one of their early kings, called Menas. The priests, however, have the story that the discoverer of the branches of learning and the arts was Hermes. But that is their kings who discovered such things unnecessary for existence, and that this was the reason why kingship in early times was bestowed not upon the sons of their former rulers, but upon such as conferred the greatest and most numerous benefits unto the peoples, whether it be the inhabitants in this way sought to provoke their kings to useful service for the benefit of all, or that they have in the very truth received an account to this effect in their sacred writings. Some of them give the story that the first gods and heroes ruled Egypt for little less than 18,000 years, that the last of the gods to rule being Horus, the son of Isis, and mortals having been kings over their country, they say, for a little less than 5,000 years, down to the 180th Olympiad, the time when we visited Egypt, and the king was Ptolemy, who took the name of the new Dionysus. 
For most of this period the rule was held by native kings, and for a small part of it by Ethiopians, Persians, and Macedonians. Now, four Ethiopians held the throne, not consecutively, but with intervals in between, for a little less than thirty-six years in all. And the Persians, after their king, Cambyses, had subdued the nation by arms, ruled for one hundred and thirty-five years, including the periods of revolt on the part of the Egyptians which they raised because they were unable to endure the harshness of their dominion and their lack of respect for the native gods. Last of all, the Macedonians, and their dynasty held rule for two hundred and seventy-six years. For the rest of the time, all the kings of the land were natives, four hundred and seventy of them being men, and five women. About all of them the priests had records which were regularly handed down in their sacred books to each successive priests from early times, giving the stature of each the former kings a description of his character and what he had done during his reign. As for us, however, it will be a long task to write each of them severally, and superfluous also, seeing that most of the material included is of no profit to us. Consequently, we shall undertake to recount briefly only the most important of the facts which deserve a place in history. After the gods, the first king of Egypt, according to the priests, was Menas, who taught the people to worship gods and offer sacrifices, and also to supply themselves with tables and couches and to use costly bedding and, in a word, introduce luxury and extravagant manners of life. For this reason, when, many generations later, Nefactus, the father of Bocoris, the wise, was king and while on campaign in Arabia ran short in supplies because the country was desert and rough. We are told that he was obliged to go without food for one day, and then to live on quite simple fare at the home of some ordinary folk in private station, and that he, enjoying the experience exceedingly, denounced luxury, and pronounced a curse on the king who had first taught the people their extravagant way of life. And so deeply did he take to heart the change which had taken place in the people's habits of eating, drinking, and sleeping, that he inscribed his curse in the hieroglyphs on the temple of Zeus in Thebes. And this, in fact, appears to be the chief reason why the fame of Menas and his honours, did not persist into later ages. And it is said that the descendants of this king, fifty-two in number all told, ruled in unbroken succession more than two thousand and forty years, but that in their reigns nothing occurred that was worthy of record. Subsequently, when Busiris, became king, and his descendants in turn ate by name, the last of the line who bore the same name as the first founded, they say, the city which Egyptians call Diospolis the Great, though the Greeks call it Thebes. Now, the circuit of it, he made one hundred and forty states and he adorned it in the marvellous fashion with great buildings and remarkable temples and dedicatory monuments of every other kind. In the same way, he caused the houses of private citizens to be constructed, in some cases four stories high, in others five, and, in general, made it the most prosperous city, not only of Egypt, but of the whole world. And since, by reason of the city's preeminent wealth and power, its fame has been spread abroad to every region, 
even the poet, we are told, has mentioned it, when he says, Nay, not for all the wealth of Thebes in Egypt, where in every hall there lieth a treasure vast, a hundred are her gates, and warriors by each issue forth, two hundred, each of them with car and steeds. Some, however, tell us, there was not one hundred gates which the city had, but rather a great many propylaea in front of its temples, and that it was from these that the title Hundred Gated was given, that is, having many gateways. Yet twenty thousand chariots did, in truth we are told, pass out from it to war, for there were once scattered along the river from Memphis to Thebes, which is over against Libya one hundred post stations, ten each having accommodation for two hundred horses. Whose foundations are pointed out even to this day. Not only this king, we have been informed, but also many of the later rulers devoted their attention to the development of the city. For no city under the sun had ever been so adorned by votive offerings, made of silver and gold and ivory, in such number and such size, by such a multitude of colossal statues, and finally by obelisks made of single blocks of stone. Of four temples erected there, the oldest is a source of wonder, for both its beauty and size, having a circuit of thirteen stades, a height of forty-five cubits, and walls twenty-four feet thick. In keeping with this magnificence, there was also the embellishment of the votive offerings within the circuit wall, marvellous for the money spent upon it, and exquisitely wrought as to workmanship. Now the buildings of the temple survived down to rather recent times, but the silver and the gold, and costly works of ivory and rare stone, were carried off by the Persians when Cambyses burned the temples of Egypt. And it was at this time, they say, that the Persians, by transferring all this wealth to Asia, and taking artisans along from Egypt, constructed their famous palaces in Persepolis and Susa, and throughout Media. So great was the wealth of Egypt of that period, they declare, that from the remnants left in the course of the sack, and after the burning the treasure, which was collected little by little, was found to be worth more than three hundred talents of gold, and no less than two thousand three hundred talents of silver. There are also in this city, they say, remarkable tombs of the early kings and of their successors, which leave to those who aspire to similar magnificence no opportunity to outdo them. Now the priests said that in their records they find forty-seven tombs of kings, but, down to the time of Ptolemy, son of Largus, they say, only fifteen remained, most of which had not been destroyed at the time we visited those regions. In the 180th Olympiad, not only do the priests of Egypt give these facts from their records, but many also of the Greeks, who visited Thebes in the time of Ptolemy, son of Largus, and composed histories of Egypt, one of whom was Hecateus, agree with what we have said. Ten states from the first tombs, he says, in which accordance and tradition are buried the concubines of Zeus, stands a monument of the king known as Osimandias. At its entrance, there is a pylon, constructed of variegated stone, two plethora in breadth, and forty-five cubits high. Passing through this one enters a rectangular peristyl, built of stone, four plethora long on each side, 
It is supported in place of pillars by monolithic figures, sixteen cubits high, wrought in the ancient manner as to shape, and the entire ceiling, which is two fathoms wide, consisting of a single stone, which is highly decorated with stars on a blue field. Beyond this peristyle, there is yet another entrance and pylon, in every respect, like the one mentioned before, save that it is more richly wrought with every manner of relief. Beside the entrance and three statues, each of a single block of black stone from Sien, of which one, that is seated the largest of any in Egypt, the foot measuring over seven cubits, while the other two at the knees of this, the one on the right and the other on the left, daughter and mother respectively, are smaller than the first mentioned. And it is not merely for the size that this work merits appropriation, but also marvellous by reason of its artistic quality and excellent because of the nature of its stone, since in a block of so great a size there is not a single crack or blemish to be seen. The inscription upon it runs, King of Kings, I am Osimandias. If anyone would know how great I am and where I lie, let him surpass one of my works. There is also another statue of his mother standing alone, a monolith twenty cubits high, and it has three diadems on its head, signifying that she was both daughter and wife and mother of a king. Beyond the pylon, he says, there is a peristyle more remarkable than the former one. In it, there are all manner of reliefs depicting the war which the king waged against those Bactrians who had revolted. Against these he had made a campaign with four hundred thousand foot soldiers and twenty thousand cavalry, the whole army having been divided into four divisions, all of which were under the command of the sons of the king. On the first wall of the king, he says, is represented in the act of besieging a walled city which is surrounded by a river, and of leading the attack against the opposing troops. He is accompanied by a lion, which is aiding him with the terrifying effect. Of those who have explained the scene, some have said that in very truth a tame lion which the king kept accompanied him the perils of battle and put the enemy to rout by his fierce onset. But others have maintained that the king, who was exceedingly brave and desirous of praising himself in a vulgar way, was trying to portray his own bold spirit in the figure of a lion. On the second wall, he adds, are wrought the captives as they are being led away by the king. They are without their privates and their hands, which apparently signifies that they were effeminate in spirit and had no hands when it came to the dread business of warfare. The third wall carries every manner of relief and excellent paintings, which portray the king as performing a sacrifice of oxen and celebrating a triumph after the war. In the centre of the peristyle, there had been constructed of the most beautiful stone and altar, open to the sky, both excellent in its workmanship and marvellous because of its size. By the last walls, are two monolithic seated statues, twenty-seven cubits high, because which, beside which, rather, are said the three entrances from the peristyle. And, by the way of these entrances, one comes into a hall, whose roof was supported by pillars, constructed in the style of an odium, and measuring two plethora on each side. In this hall, there are many wooden statues, representing parties in litigation, whose eyes are fixed upon the judges who decide their cases, and these, in turn, are shown in relief on one of the walls, to the number of thirty, and without any hands, 
and in their midst the chief justice, with a figure of truth hanging from his neck, and beholding his eyes closed. And at his side a great number of books, and these figures show by their attitude that the judges shall receive no gift, and that the chief justice shall have his eyes upon the truth alone. Next to these courts, he says, is an ambulatory, crowded with buildings in every kind, in which there are representations of the foods which are sweetest to the taste of every variety. Here are to be found reliefs, in which the king, adorned in colours, is represented as offering the god the gold and silver, which he received each year from the silver and gold mines of all Egypt. And an inscription below gives the total amount, which, summed up according to its value in silver, is thirty-two million minas. Next comes the sacred library, which bears the inscription, Healing Place of the Soul. And contiguous to this building are statues of all the gods of Egypt, to each of whom the king in like manner makes the offering appropriate to him as he thought he was submitting proof before Osiris and his assessors in the underworld that to the end of his days he had lived a life of piety and justice towards both men and gods. Next to the library, and separated from it by a party wall, is an exquisitely constructed hall, which contains a table with couches for twenty, and statues for Zeus and Hera, as well as of the king. Here, it would seem, the body of the king is also buried. In a circle about this building, there are many chambers which contain excellent paintings of all the animals which are held sacred in Egypt. There is an ascent leading through these chambers to the tomb as a whole. At the top of this ascent, there is a circular border of gold crowning the monument, 365 cubits in circumference and one cubit thick. Upon this the days of the year are inscribed, one in each cubit of length, and by each day the risings and settings of the stars as nature ordains them, and the signs indicating the effects which the Egyptian astrologers hold that they produce. This border, they said, has been plundered by Cambyses, and the Persians when he conquered Egypt. Such, they say, was the tomb of Osimandas the king, which is considered far to have excelled all others, not only in the amount of money lavished upon it, but also in the ingenuity shown by the artificers. The Thebans say that they are the earliest of all men, and that the first people among whom philosophy and the exact science of the stars was discovered, since their country enables them to observe more distinctly than others the rising and setting of the stars. Peculiar to them is also their ordering of the months and years, for they do not reckon the days by the moon, but by the sun, making their month of thirty days, but they add five and a quarter days to the twelve months, and in this way fill out the cycle of the year. But they do not intercalate months or subtract days, as most of the Greeks do. They appear to have made careful observations of the eclipses, both of sun and moon, and predict them, foretelling without error all the events which actually occur. Of the descendants of this king, the eighth known is Ucareos, founded Memphis, the most renowned city of Egypt, for he chose the most favourable spot in all the land, where the Nile divides into several branches, to form the delta, as it is called from its shape, and the result was that the city, excellently situated as it was the gates of the delta, continually controlled commerce passing out of Upper Egypt. Now he gave the city a circumference, 
of 150 stades, and made it remarkably strong and adapted to its purpose by works of following nature. Since the Nile flowed around the city and covered it at the time of inundation, he threw out a huge mound of earth on the south to serve as a barrier against the swelling of the river, and also as a citadel against the attacks of enemies by land. And all around other sides, he dug a large, deep lake, which, by taking up the force of the river, and occupying all the space about the city, except where the mound had been thrown out, gave it remarkable strength. And so happily did the founder of the city reckon upon the suitableness of this site, that the practicality of all subsequent li kings left Thebes, and established both their palaces and official residences there. Consequently, from this time, Thebes began to wane, and Memphis to increase, until the time of Alexander the king, for after he had founded the city on the sea which bears his name, all the kings of Egypt after him concentrated their interest on the development of it. Some adorned it with magnificent palaces, some with docks and harbours, and others with further notable dedications and buildings, to such an extent that is generally reckoned the first or second city of the inhabited world. But a detailed inscription of this city we shall set forth in the appropriate period. The founder of Memphis, after constructing the mound and the lake, erected a palace, which, while not inferior to those of other nations, yet was no match for the grandeur of design and love of the beauty shown by the kings who preceded him. For the inhabitants of Egypt consider the period of this life to be of no account whatsoever. But the place, the greatest value on the time after death, when they will be remembered for their virtue. And, while they give the name of lodgings to the dwelling of the living, thus intimating that the, we dwell in them but a brief time, they call the tombs of the dead eternal homes, since the dead spend endless eternity in Hades. Consequently, they give less thought to the furnishings on their houses, but on the manner of their burials they do not forego any excess of zeal. Now, the aforementioned city was named, according to some, after the daughters of the king who founded it. They tell the story that she was loved by the river Nile, who had assumed the form of a bull, and gave birth to Egyptus, a man famous among the natives for his virtue, from whom the entire land received its name. For upon succeeding to the throne he showed himself to be a kindly king, just, and in a word upright in all manners, and so since he was held by all to merit great appropriation because of his good will, he received the honour mentioned. Twelve generations after the king just named Moeris succeeded to the throne in Egypt, and built in Memphis itself the North Propylaea, which far surpasses the others in magnificence, the ten Skoeni above the city he excavated a lake which was remarkable for its utility, and undertaking of incredible magnitude. For its circumference, they say, is three thousand six hundred stades, and its depth in most parts fifty fathoms. What a man, accordingly, in trying to estimate the magnitude of the work, would not reasonably inquire how many myriads of men labouring for how many years were required for its completion. And as for the utility of this lake, and its contribution to the welfare of all the inhabitants of Egypt, as well as for the ingenuity of the king, no man may praise them highly enough to do justice to the truth. 
For since the Nile did not rise at a fixed height every year, and yet the fruitfulness of the country depended on the constancy of the flood level, he excavated the lake to receive the excess water, in order that the river might not, by an excessive volume of flow, immoderately flood the land and form marshes and pools, nor by failing to rise to the proper height ruin harvests by lack of water. He also dug a canal, eighty stades long and three plethora wide, from the river to the lake, and by this canal, sometimes turning the river into the lake and sometimes shutting it off again, he furnished the farmers with an opportune supply of water, opening and closing the entrance by a skilful device, and yet a considerable expense, for it cost no less than fifty talents if a man wanted to open or close this work. The lake has continued to serve well the needs of the Egyptians, even down to our time, and bears the name of its builder, being called to this day the Lake of Moeris. Now the king, in excavating it, left a spot in the centre, where he built a tomb and two pyramids, a stayed in height, one for himself and another for his wife, on the tops of which he placed some stone statues seated upon thrones, thinking that by these monuments he would leave behind him an imperishable commemoration of his good deeds. The income accruing from the fish taken from the lake he gave to his wife for her ungruance and general embellishment. The value of the catch amounting to a talent of silver daily, for there are twenty-two different kinds of fish in the lake, they say, and they are caught in such abundance that the people engaged in salting them, though exceedingly many, can scarcely keep up with their task. Now, this is the account which the Egyptians gave of Moeris. Sensois, they say, who became king seven generations later, performed more renowned and greater deeds than did any of his predecessors. And since, with regard to this king, not only are the Greek writers at variance with one another, but also among the Egyptians, the priests and poets who sang his praises gave conflicting stories. We, for our part, shall endeavour to give the most probable account, and that which most nearly agrees with the monuments still standing in the land. Now, at the birth of Sosaurus, his father did a thing worthy of a great man and a king. Gathering together from all Egypt the male children which had been born on the same day, and assigning them nurses and guardians, he prescribed the same training and education for them all, on the theory that those who had been reared in closest companionship had enjoyed the same frank relationship, would be most loyal, and as fellow combatants in the wars most brave. He amply provided for their every need, and then trained the youths by unremitting exercises and hardships, for no one of them was allowed to have anything to eat, unless he had first run 180 stades. Consequently, upon attaining to manhood, they were all veritable athletes of robustness of body, and in spirit, qualified for leadership and endurance because of the training which they had received in the most excellent of pursuits. First of all, Sensois, his companions, also accompanying him, were sent by his father with an army into Arabia, where he was subjected to the laborious training of hunting wild animals, and, after hardening himself to the privations of thirst and hunger, conquered the entire nation of the Arabs, which had never been enslaved before his day and then on being sent to the regions to the west, he subdued the larger part of Libya, though in years still no more than a youth. 
and when he ascended to the throne upon the death of his father, being filled with confidence by reason of his earlier exploits, he undertook to conquer the inhabited earth. There are those who say that he was urged to acquire empire over the whole world by his own daughter, a theotis, who, according to some, was far more intelligent than any of her day, and showed her father that the campaign would be an easy one, while according to others she had the gift of prophecy, and knew beforehand by means both of sacrifices and the practice of sleeping in temples, as well as from the signs which appear in the heavens that would take place in the future. Some have also written that the birth of Sesoius, his father, had thought that Hephaestus had appeared to him in a dream, and told him that the son who had been born to rule over the whole civilized world, and that for this reason, therefore, his father collected the children of the same age as his son, and granted them royal training, thus preparing them beforehand for an attack upon the whole world and that his son, upon attaining manhood, trusting in the prediction of the god, was led to undertake this campaign. In preparing for this undertaking, he first all confirmed the good will of all the Egyptians towards himself, feeling it to be necessary, if he were to bring his plan to a successful end, that his soldiers on the campaign should be ready to die for their leaders and that those left behind in their native lands should not rise in revolt. He therefore showed kindness to everyone, by all means at his disposal, winning over some by presents of money, others by gifts of land, and others by remission of penalties, and the entire people he attached to himself by his friendly intercourse and kindly ways, for he set free, unharmed everyone who was held for some crime against the king, and cancelled the obligations of those who were in prison for debt, there being a great many multitude in the jails. And, dividing the entire land into thirty-six parts, which the Egyptians call gnomes, he set over each a nomarch, who, should superintend the collection of the royal revenues, and administer all the affairs of his division. He then chose out the strongest of the men, and formed an army worthy of the greatness of his undertaking, for he enlisted six hundred thousand foot soldiers, twenty-four thousand cavalry, and twenty-seven thousand war chariots. In command of several divisions of his troops, he set up his companions, who were, by this time, inured to warfare, had striven for a reputation for valour from their youth, and cherished with a brotherly love both their king and one another, the number of them being over seventeen hundred. And upon all these commanders he bestowed allotments of the best land in Egypt, in order that, enjoying sufficient income and lacking nothing, they might sedulously practice the art of war. After he had made ready his army, he marched first against all the Ethiopians who dwell south of Egypt, and after conquering them, he forced that people to pay a tribute in ebony, gold, and the tusks of elephants. Then he sent out a fleet of four hundred ships into the Red Sea, being the first Egyptian to build warships, and not only took possession of the islands in these waters, but also subdued the coast of the mainland as far as India, while he himself made his way by land with his army and subdued all of Asia. Not only did he, in fact, visit the territory which was afterwards won by Alexander of Macedon, but also certain peoples in those countries Alexander did not cross. For he even passed over the river Ganges, and visited all of India as far as the ocean, as well as the tribes of the Scythians as far as the river Tanae, which divides Europe from Asia. And, 
It was in this time, they say, that some Egyptians, having been left behind near the lake of Maotus, founded the nation of Golgi, and the proof which they offer of the Egyptian origin in this nation is the fact that the Colchi practice circumcision, even as the Egyptians do, the custom continuing among the colonists sent out from Egypt, as it also did in the case of the Jews. In some way, he brought all the rest of Asia into subjugation, subjection rather, as well as most of the Cyclades islands. And after he had crossed into Europe, and was on his way throughout the whole length of Thrace, he nearly lost his army through lack of food and difficult nature of the land. Consequently, he fixed the limits of his expedition in Thrace, and set up stilly in many parts of the regions which he had acquired. And these carried forward the following inscription in Egyptian writing, which is called Sacred. This land, the king of kings, the lord of lords, Sisois, subdued with his own arms. And he fashioned with Stelle, with a representation, in case the enemy people were warlike, of the privy parts of a man, and in this case they were abject and cowardly, of those of a woman, holding that the quality of the spirit of each people would be set forth most clearly to succeeding generations by the dominant member of the body. And in some places, he also erected a stone statue of himself, armed with bow and arrows and a spear, in height four cubits and four palms, which was indeed his own stature. He dealt gently with all conquered peoples, and, after concluding his campaign in nine years, commanded the nations to bring presents each year to Egypt according their ability, while he himself, assembling a multitude of captives which has never been surpassed, and a mass of any other booty, returned to his country, having accomplished the greatest deeds of any king of Egypt to this day. All the temples of Egypt Moreover, he adorned with notable votive offerings and spoils, and honoured with gifts according to his merits every soldier who had distinguished himself for bravery. And, in general, as a result of this campaign, not only did the army, which had bravely shared in the deeds of the king, and had gathered great wealth, make a brilliant homeward journey, but it also came to pass that all Egypt was filled to overflowing with benefits of every kind. Sisois now relieved his people of the labours of war and grant to the comrades who had bravely shared in his deeds a carefree life in the enjoyment of the good things which they had won, while he himself, being ambitious for glory and intent upon everlasting fame, constructed works which were great and marvellous in their conception, as well as in the lavishness with which the cost was provided, winning in this way immortal glory for himself and for the Egyptians securely combined with ease for all time. For, beginning with the gods first, he built in each city of Egypt a temple to the god who was held in special reverence by its inhabitants, on these labours he used no Egyptians, but constructed them all by the hands of his captives alone, and for this reason he placed an inscription on every temple that no native had toiled upon it. And it is said that the captives bought from Babylon revolted from the king, being unable to endure the hardships entailed by his works and they seized a strong position on the banks of the river, maintained a warfare against the Egyptians, and ravaged the neighbouring territory. But finally, on being granted an amnesty, they established a colony on the spot, which they also named Babylon after their native land. 
for similar reason, they say. The city of Troy, likewise, which even to this day exists on the bank of the Nile, received its name. For Menelaus, on his voyage from Ilium with a great number of captives, crossed over into Egypt, and the Trojans, revolting from him, seized a certain place and maintained warfare until he granted them safety and freedom, whereupon they founded a city, to which they gave the name of their native land. I am not unaware that, regarding the cities named above, Cesias of Sinidus has given a different account, saying that some of those who had come into Egypt with Semiramis founded them, calling them after their native lands. But on such matters as these it is not easy to set forth the precise truth, and yet the disagreements among historians must be considered worthy of record, in order that the reader may be able to decide upon the truth without prejudice. Now, Sisoas threw up many great mounds of earth, and moved to them such cities as happened to be situated on the ground but was not naturally elevated, in order that at the time of the flooding of the river both the inhabitants and their herds might have a safe place of retreat. And over the entire land from Memphis to the sea, he dug frequent canals leading from the river, his purpose being that the people might carry out the harvesting of their crops quickly and easily, and that, though through constant intercourse of the peasants with one another, every district might enjoy both an easy livelihood and a great abundance of things to which minister a man's enjoyment. The greatest result of this work, however, was that he made the country secure and difficult to access against attacks by enemies, for practically all the best parts of Egypt, which before this time had been easy of passage for horses and cart, has from this time on been very difficult for an enemy to invade by reason of the great number of canals leading from the river. He also fortified a wall, the side of Egypt which faces east, as a defence against the inroads from Syria and Arabia. The wall extended through the desert, from Pelusium to Heliopolis, and its length was some fifteen hundred stades. Moreover, he also built a ship of cedar wood, which was two hundred and eighty cubits long, and plated on the exterior with gold, and the interior with silver. This ship he presented as a votive offering to the god who was held in special reverence in Thebes, as well as two obelisks of hard stone, and one hundred and twenty cubits high, upon which he inscribed the magnitude of his army, his revenues, and the number of the peoples which he had subdued. Also, in Memphis, in the temples of Hephaestus, he dedicated monolithic statues of himself and of his wife, thirty cubits high, and of his sons twenty cubits high, the occasion of their erection being as follows. When Sosoes had returned to Egypt after his great campaign and was tarrying at Pelusium, his brother, who was entertaining Sosoes and his wife and children, plotted against them, for when they had fallen asleep after the drinking he piled great quantities of dry rushes which he had kept in readiness for some time around the tent at night, and set them afire. When the fire suddenly blazed up, those who had been assigned to wait upon the king came to his aid in a churlish fashion, as men would, heavy with wine. But Sosoius, raising both hands to the heavens with a prayer to the gods for preservation of his children and wife, dashed out safe through the flames. For this unexpected escape, he honoured the rest of the gods with votive offerings, as stated above, and Hephaestus most of all, on the ground that was with his intervention that he may be saved. 
Although many great deeds have been credited to Sesois, his magnificence seems best to have been shown in the treatment which he accorded to the foreign pretendants when he went forth from his palace. The kings whom he had allowed to continue their rule over the peoples which he had subdued, and all others who received from him the most important positions of command, would present themselves in Egypt at specified times, bring him gifts, and the king would welcome them, in all other matters show them honour and special preference. But, whenever he intended to visit a temple or a city, he would remove the horses from his four-horse chariot, and in their place yoke the kings and other potentes, taking them four at a time. In this way, showing to all men, as he thought, that having conquered the mightiest of other kings and those renowned for their excellence, he now had no one who could compete with him for the prize of excellence. This king is thought to have surpassed all former rulers in power and military exploit, and also in the magnitude and number of the votive offerings and public works which he built in Egypt. And after a reign of thirty-three years, he deliberately took his own life, his eyesight having failed him. And this act won him the admiration, not only of the priests of Egypt, but of the other inhabitants as well. For it was known that he had caused the end of his life to comport with the loftiness of spirit shown in his achievements. So great became the fame of this king, and so enduring through the ages, that when many generations later Egypt fell under the power of the Persians and Darius, the father of Xerxes, he bent upon a placing statue of himself in Memphis before that of Sesois. The chief priest opposed it in a speech, which he made in an assembly of the priests, to that effect that Darius had not yet surpassed the deeds of Sesois. And the king was far from being angered, but on the contrary, being pleased at the frankness of his speech, so that he would strive to not to be found behind that ruler in any point when he had attained his years, and ask them to base their judgment upon the deeds of each of the same age, for that was the fairest test of their excellence. As regards Sersuis, then, we shall rest content with what has been said. But his son, succeeding the throne and assuming his father's appellation, did not accomplish a single thing in war or otherwise worthy of mention. Though he did have a singular experience, he lost his sight, either because he shared in his father's bodily constitution, or, as some fictitiously relate, because of his impiety towards the river, since once when caught in a storm upon it, he had hurled a spear into the rushing current. Forced by this ill fortune to turn to the gods for aid, he strove over a long period to propitiate the deity by numerous sacrifices and honours, but received no consideration. But in the tenth year, an oracular command was given to him, to do honour to the god in Heliopolis, and bathe his face in the urine of a woman who had never known any other man than her husband. Therefore he began with his own wife, and made trial of many, but found not one that was chaste to save a certain gardener's wife, whom he married as soon as he was recovered. All the other women he burned alive in a certain village to which the Egyptians, because of this incident, gave the name Holy Field, and to the god in Heliopolis, out of gratitude for his benefaction, he dedicated in accordance with the injunction of the oracle two monolithic obelisks, eight cubits wide and one hundredth high. After this, King 
a long line of successors and to the throne accomplished no deed worth recording. But Amasis, who became king many generations later, ruled the masses of people with great harshness. Many he punished unjustly, great numbers he deprived of their possessions, and towards all his conduct was without exception contemptuous and arrogant. Now, for a time, his victims bore up under this, being unable in any way to protect themselves against those of greater power. But when Actisanes, the king of the Ethiopians, led an army against Amasis, their hatred seized the opportunity, and most Egyptians revolted. As a consequence, since he was easily overcome, Egypt fell under rule of the Ethiopians. But Actisanes carried his good fortune, as a man should, and conducted himself in a kindly manner toward his subjects. For instance, he had his own manner of dealing with thieves, neither putting to death, such as were liable to that punishment, nor letting them go without punishment at all. For after he had gathered together out of all the land those who were charged with some crime, and had held a thoroughly fair examination of their cases, he took on all who had been judged guilty, and, cutting off their noses, settled them in a colony on the edge of the desert, founding the city, which was called Rhinocolura, after the lot of its inhabitants. This city, which lies on the border between Egypt and Syria not far from the sea coast, is wanting in practically everything which is necessary for a man's existence, for it is surrounded by land which is full of brine, while within the walls there is but a small supply of water from wells, and this is impure and very bitter to the taste. But he settled them in this country in order that in case they continued to practice their original manner of life, they might not prey upon innocent people, and also that they might not pass unrecognized as they mingled with the rest of mankind. And yet, despite the fact that they had been cast out into a desert country, which lacked practically everything useful for them, they contrived a way of living appropriate to the dearth about them, since Nature forced them to devise every possible means to combat their destitution. For instance, by cutting down reeds in the neighborhood and splitting them, they made long nets, which they set up along the beach for a distance of many stades, and hunted quails, for these are driven in large conveys from the open sea. And in hunting them they got a sufficient number to provide themselves with food. After the death of this king, the Egyptians regained control of their government and placed on the throne a native, Mendes, who some called Marus. So far as war is concerned, this ruler did not accomplish anything at all, but he did build himself a tomb known as the Labyrinth, which was not so remarkable for its size as it was impossible to imitate in respect to its ingenious design for a man who enters it, cannot easily find his way out, unless he gets a guide who is thoroughly acquainted with the structure. And some say that Diodalus, visiting Egypt and admiring the skill shown in the building, also constructed from Minos, the king of Crete, a labyrinth like the one in Egypt, in which was kept, as the myth relates, the beast called Minotaur. However, the labyrinth in Crete has entirely disappeared. Whether it be that some ruler raised it to the ground, or that time effaced the work, but the one in Egypt has stood intact in its entire structure down to our lifetime. After the death of this king, there were no rulers for five generations, and then a man of obscure origin, was chosen king, whom the Egyptians call Cetes, but 
who among the Greeks is thought to be that of Proteus, who lived at the time of the war about Ilium. Some tradition records that this Proteus was experienced in knowledge of the winds, and that he would change his body, sometimes into the form of different animals, sometimes into a tree or a fire or something else. And it so happens that the account of which the priest gave of Setes is in agreement with this tradition. For according to the priests, from the close association which the king constantly maintained with the astrologers, he had gained experience in such manners, and from a custom which has been passed down among the kings of Egypt, has arisen the myths current among the Greeks about the way Proteus changed his shape. For it was a practice among the rulers of Egypt to wear upon their heads the forepart of a lion or bull or snake as part of the symbols of their rule at times also trees or fire, and in some cases they even carried on their heads large bunches of fragrant herbs or incense, these last serving to enhance their comeliness, and at the same time to fill all other men with fear and religious awe. On the death of Proteus, his son Remphis succeeded to the throne, this ruler spent his whole life looking after the revenues and amassing riches from every source. Now because of his miserly character, he spent nothing either on votive offerings to the gods or benefactions to the inhabitants. Consequently, since he had not been so much king as only an efficient steward, in the place of a fame based upon the virtue, he left treasure larger than of any king before him, for according to tradition he amassed some four hundred thousand talents of silver and gold. After Remphis died, kings succeeded to the throne for seven generations who were confirmed sluggards and devoted only to indulgence and luxury. Consequently, in the priestly records no costly building of theirs nor any deed worthy of historical record is handed down in connection with them, except in the case of one ruler, Nileus, who, from whom the river came to be named the Nile, though formerly called Egyptus. This ruler constructed a great number of canals at opportune places, and in many ways showed himself eager to increase the usefulness of the Nile, and therefore became the cause of the present appellation of the river. The eighth king, Chemis of Memphis, ruled fifty years and constructed the largest of the three pyramids, which are numbered among the seven wonders of the world. These pyramids, which are situated on the side of Egypt, which is toward Libya, are 120 stades from Memphis and 45 from the Nile, and by the immensity of their structures and skill shown in their execution, they fill the beholder with wonder and astonishment. For the largest is in the form of a square, and has a base length on each side of seven plethra and a height of over six. It also gradually tapers to the top, where each side is six cubits long. The entire construction is of hard stone, which is difficult to work, but lasts forever. For though no fewer than a thousand years have elapsed, as they say, to our lifetime, or as some writers have it, more than three thousand four hundred, the stones remain to this day still preserving the original position that the entire structure is undecayed. It is said that the stone was conveyed over a great distance from Arabia, and that the construction was effected by means of mounds, since cranes had not been invented at the time. And the most remarkable thing in that account is that though the constructions were on great scale and the country round them consists of nothing but sand, no trace remains of either any mound of the dressing of the stones so that they do not have the appearance of being slow handiwork of men, 
but look like a sudden creation, as though they had been made by some god and set down bodily in the surrounding sand. Certain Egyptians would make a marvel of these things, saying that inasmuch the mounds were built of sand and saltpeter. When the river was let in, it melted them down, and completely effaced them without the intervention of man's hand. However, there is not a word of truth in this, but the entire material for the mounds, raised as they were by labour of many hands, was returned by the same means to the place from which it came. For three hundred and sixty thousand men, as they say, were employed on the undertaking, and the whole structure was scarcely completed in twenty years. Upon the death of this king, his brother, Kefren, succeeded to the throne and ruled nearly fifty-six years. But some say that it was not the brother of Chemis, but his son, named Chabries, who took the throne. All writers, however, agree that it was the next ruler who, emulating the example of his predecessor, built the second pyramid, which was equal to the one just mentioned in the skill displayed in its execution, but far behind it in size, since its base length on each side is only a stade. And an inscription on the larger pyramid gives the sum of money expended upon it, since the writing sets forth that on vegetables and purgatives for the workmen were there paid out of a sixteen hundred talents. The smaller bears no inscription, but has steps cut into one side, and though the two kings built the pyramids to serve as their tombs, in the event neither of them was buried in them. For the multitudes, because of the hardships which they had endured in the building of them, and many cruel and violent acts of these kings, were filled with anger against those who had caused their sufferings, and openly threatened to tear their bodies asunder and cast them in, despite out of the tombs. Consequently, each ruler, when dying, enjoined his kinsmen to bury his body secretly in an unmarked place. After these rulers, Macarinus, to whom some give the name Mencherinus, a son of the builder of the first pyramid, became king. He undertook the construction of a third pyramid, but died before the entire structure had been completed. The base length of each side, he had made three plethora, and for fifteen courses he built the walls of black stone, like that found in Thebes, but the rest of it he filled out with stone like that found in the other pyramids. In size, this structure falls behind those mentioned above, but far surpasses them in skill displayed in its execution, and the great cost of the stone. And on the north side of the pyramid is an inscription stating that its builder was Macarinus. This ruler, they say, out of indignation, and the cruelty of his predecessors aspired to live an honourable life, and one devoted to the welfare of his subjects. And he continually did many things that might best help evoke the good will of the people toward him. And more especially, when he gave audiences, he spent a great amount of money giving presents to such honest men, as he thought that not fared well in the courts of law as they deserved. There are also three more pyramids, each one of which is one plethora long on each side, and in general construction is like the others save in size. And these pyramids, they say, were built by the three kings named above for their wives. It is generally agreed that these monuments far surpass all other constructions in Egypt, not only in their size and cost, but also in the skill displayed by their builders. And they say that the architects of the monuments are more deserving of admiration than the kings who furnished the means for their execution, 
for in bringing their plans to completion the former called upon the individual souls and their zeal for honour, but the latter only used the wealth which they had inherited and the grievous toil of other men. But, with regard to the pyramids, there is no complete agreement among either the inhabitants of the country or the historians, for according to some the kings mentioned above were the builders, according to others, there were different kings. For instance, it is said that Armaeus built the largest, Amosus the second, and Inarus the third. And this last pyramid, some say, is the tomb of the courtesan Rhodopos. For some of the nomarchs became her lovers, and as the account goes, and out of their passion for her, carried the building through to a completion as a joint undertaking. After the kings mentioned above, Bocoris succeeded to the throne, a man who was altogether contemptible in personal appearance, but in sagacity far surpassed all former kings. Much later Egypt was ruled by Sabaco, who was by birth an Ethiopian, and yet in piety and uprightness far surpassed his predecessors. A proof of his goodness may be found in the abolition of the severest of customary penalties. I refer to the taking of life, for instead of executing the condemned, he put them in chains at forced labour for the cities, and their services constructed many dikes and dug out a few well-placed canals. For he held that in this way he had reduced those who were being chastised the severity of their punishment, while for the cities he had procured, in exchange for useless penalties, something of great utility. And the excessiveness of his piety may be inferred from a vision that he had in a dream, and his consequent abdication of the throne. For he thought that the god of Thebes had told him while he was asleep that he would not be able to reign over Egypt in happiness, or for any great length of time, unless he should cut the bodies of all priests in twain, and accompany his retinue pass through the very mists of them. And when this dream came again and again, he summoned the priests from all over the land, and told them that by his presence in the country he was offending the god. For, were that not the case, such a command would not be given to him in his sleep. And so he would rather, he continued, departing pure of all defilement from the land, deliver his life to destiny, then offend the Lord, stain his own life by an impious slaughter and reign over Egypt. And in the end, he returned to the kingdom of the Egyptians, and retired again to Ethiopia. There being no head of government in Egypt for two years, the masses betaking themselves to tumults and the killing of one another, the twelve most important leaders formed a solemn league among themselves, and after they had met together for the council in Memphis, and had drawn up agreements setting forth their mutual goodwill and loyalty, they proclaimed themselves kings. After they had reigned in accordance with their oaths and promises, and had maintained their mutual concord for a period of fifteen years, they set about to construct a common tomb for themselves. Their thought being that, just as in their lifetime they had cherished a cordial regard for one another, and enjoyed equal honours, so that after their death their bodies would rest in one place, and the memorial which they had erected would hold one embrace the glory of those buried within. Being full of zeal for this undertaking, they eagerly strove to surpass all preceding rulers in the magnitude of their structure. For selecting a site at the entrance to Lake Moeris in Libya, they constructed their tomb of the finest stone, and they made it in the form of a square but in magnitude stayed in length one side, and in the carvings, and indeed in all the workmanship, they left nothing wherein succeeding rulers could excel them. 
for as a man passed through the enclosing wall, he found himself in a court, surrounded by columns, forty on each side, and the roof of the court consisting of a single stone, which was worked into coffers and adorned with excellent paintings. The court also contained memorials of the native district of each king, and of the temples and sacrificial rites therein, artistically portrayed in the most beautiful of paintings. And in general, the kings are said to have made the plan of their tomb on such expensive and enormous scale, that had they not died before the execution of their purpose, they would have left no possibility for others to surpass them, so far as the construction of monuments is concerned. After these kings had reigned over Egypt for fifteen years, it came to pass that the sovereignty devolved upon one man for the following reasons. Samatychus of Sais, who was one of the twelve kings in charge of the regions lying along the sea, furnished wares for all merchants, and especially for the Phoenicians and the Greeks, and since in this manner he disposed of the products of his own distress and profit, and exchanged them for those of other peoples. He was not only possessed of great wealth, but also enjoyed friendly relations with peoples and rulers. And this was the reason, they say, why other kings became envious and opted for war against him. Some of the early historians, however, tell this fanciful story. The generals had received an oracle to the effect that the first one of their number to pour a libation from a bronze bowl to the god in Memphis should rule over Egypt. And when one of the priests brought out of the temple eleven gold balls, Samatychus took off his helmet and poured the libation from it. Now his colleagues, although suspecting his act, were not ready to put him to death, but drove him instead from public life, with orders that he should spend his days in the marshes along the sea. Whether they fell out for this reason, or because of the envy which is mentioned above they felt towards him, at any rate, Samatychus, calling mercenaries from Caria and Ionia, overcame the others in a pitched battle, near the city called Mon Memphis and of the kings who opposed him, some were slain in battle, and some were driven out into Libya, and were no longer able to dispute with him for the throne. After Symmetricus had established his authority over the entire kingdom, he built for the god in Memphis the East Propylon, and the enclosure about the temples, supporting it with colossi twelve cubits high in place of pillars, and among the mercenaries he distributed notable gifts, over and above the promised pay, and gave them the region called the camps to dwell in, and apportioned to them much land in the region, lying a little up from the river to the Pelusiac mouth, they being subsequently removed thence by Amasus, who reigned many years later, and settled by him in Memphis, and since Samatychus had established his rule with the aid of the mercenaries, he henceforth entrusted before others the administration of the empire, and regularly maintained large mercenary forces, once in connection with the campaign in Syria, when he was going to give the mercenaries more honourable place in honour by battle, by putting them on the right wing and showing the native troops less honour, by assigning them to the position on the left wing of the phalanx, the Egyptians, angered by this slight, and being over two hundred thousand strong, revolted and set out for Ethiopia, having determined to win for themselves a country of their own. The king at first sent home some of his generals to make excuse for the dishonour done to them, but since no heed was paid, he set out in person along them by boat, accompanied by his friends. And when they still continued their march along the Nile, and when they were about to cross the boundary of Egypt, 
he besought them change their purpose, and reminded them of their temples, their homeland, and of their wives and children. But they, all crying aloud and striking their spears against their shields, declared so long as they had weapons in their hands, they would easily find a homeland. And lifting their garments and pointing to their genitals, they said that so long as they had those, they would never be in want of either wives or children. After such a display of high courage and utter disdain, for what among other men is regarded as the greatest of consequence, they seized the best part of Ethiopia, and after apportioning much land among themselves, they made their home there. Although Samatycus was greatly grieved over these things, he put in order the affairs of Egypt, looked after the royal revenues, and then formed alliances with both Athens and certain other Greek states. He also regularly treated with kindness any foreigners who sojourned in Egypt of their own free will, and was also so great an admirer of the Hellenes that he gave his sons a Greek education. And, speaking generally, he was the first Egyptian king to open to other nations the trading places throughout the rest of Egypt, and to offer a large measure of security to strangers from across the seas. For his predecessors in power had consistently closed Egypt to strangers, either killing or enslaving those who touched its shores. Indeed, it was because of the objection to strangers on the part of the people that the impiety of Busiris became a byword among the Greeks. Although this impiety was not actually such as it was described, but made into a fictitious myth because of the exceptional disrespect of the Egyptians for ordinary custom. Four generations after Samatycus, Apries was king for twenty-two years. He made a campaign with strong land and sea forces against Cyprus and Phoenicia, took Sidon by storm, and so terrified the other cities of Phoenicia that he secured their submission. He also defeated the Phoenicians and the Cyprians in a great sea battle, and returned to Egypt with much booty. After this, he sent a strong native force against Kyrene and Barque, and, when the larger part of it was lost, the survivors became estranged from him, for they felt he had organized the expedition with a view to its destruction, in order that his rule over the rest of the Egyptians may be more secure, and so they revolted. The man sent by the king to treat with them one Amasus, a prominent Egyptian, paid no attention to the orders given to him to effect a reconciliation, but, on the contrary, increased their estrangement, joined their revolt, and was himself chosen king. When a little later all the rest of the native Egyptians also went over to Amasus, the king was in such straits that he was forced to flee for safety to the mercenaries who were numbered some thirty thousand men. A pitched battle accordingly took place near the village of Maria, and the Egyptians prevailed in a struggle. Apries fell alive into the hands of the enemy, and was strangled to death, and Amasis, arranging the affairs of the kingdom in whatever manner seemed him to be best, ruled over the Egyptians in accordance with the laws and was held in great favour. He also reduced the cities of Cyprus, and adorned many temples with noteworthy votive offerings. After a reign of fifty-five years, he ended his days at the time when Cambyses, the king of the Persians, attacked Egypt in the third year of the sixty-third Olympiad, that in which Parmenides of Camarina won the stadion. Well, thank you very much for listening. Wasn't that interesting? Nothing better than a bit of the old Diodorus Sicilus. 
Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, allow me to thank my top tier supporters Dark, Gary, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, Wendy, Jaden, Sherry, Jessica, Christine, Sally, Katiana, Christine, Fizabo, Legitimus, Maverick, and Susan. Thank you very much. And I will see you in the next video. Hope you enjoyed it. Lots of love to you all, and thank you for watching. Good night.